Listen to the new Thin Green Line podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Game wardens John Norris and Wayne Saunders talk about wildlife, the outdoors, law enforcement, environmental subjects mixed with current events and guests that are part of the Thin Green Line. And if you are one of those visual people like me, for $5 a month, you can see the actual podcast on Patreon.com. Just search the Thin Green Line podcast on Patreon.com and join us. The Copper Pig Brewery in Lancaster, New Hampshire, is brewing traditional and innovative high-quality beers, as well as serving a large menu of creative comfort foods, appealing to all walks of life, with daily specials sourcing many ingredients locally. Charitable involvement and support of their community is the cornerstone to the Copper Pig Brewery's mission. Voted number one in New Hampshire by WMUR Viewer's Choice two years in a row, 2018 and 2019. Please join me at the Copper Pig. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join huntofalifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference. This podcast is brought to you by Maine Operation Game Thief and Wildlife Heritage, a foundation of New Hampshire at nhwildlifeheritage.org and International Wildlife Crime Stoppers. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from game wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch. So John, we're up on another episode, 42 Warden's Watch. That's great. But there's some, there's some pretty cool things going on, and boy, you, you kind of shocked me when you put out that video of your knife that came over Instagram and Facebook. It was like, uh, talk about a professional job and showing somebody how to use your knife. It was just, it, it blew me away. And it blew a lot of people away because I got a lot of responses. A lot of people were asking about your knife and, you know, can you give us a little history? I mean, yeah, it can't get much better than that video, but, it, uh, you know, maybe some backstory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wayne, for sure. And I got to, before we go any further, I got to give a shout out to my good friend, Rick Stewart, who is the the senior producer of American Zealot Productions that put mm. that commercial for the Trailblazer Thin Green Line folding knife. Um, he, you know, did our Patriot Profiles Life of Duty series for NRA TV, was a top hit on Sportsman's Channel back in the day, um, and just does quality work because he believes in good product if they support a good mission. Mm. And as you know, the whole thing about my uh, my Trailblazer Thin Green Line folding knife, and it's an everyday carry folder, and it was uh, kind of designed to be the knife I never had in, you know, almost 30 years of being a game warden. And all of us on the game warden conservation Thin Green Line front we, we rely on our knives, right? We carry them every day, just mm. like everything else on our, our belt, our gun, our, you know, defensive tools, right. uh, you name it. So yeah, um, really fortunate to be sponsored by V knives, which is Mike Bellacamp's company out of Washington. And he's been designing knives for 30, 40 years himself. And we made this thing to kind of have a little bit of everything, a glass breaker, you know, to, to mm-hmm. get emergency access or, 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 uh, exiting a vehicle if you're trapped, anything like that, uh, a seatbelt cutter or an emergency harness cutter that has its own razor blade. So when you do cut through 
harnesses and webbing for any reason, you don't dull the D2 steel blade. And this is a razor sharp blade made to really, really hold up, hence using high carbon D2 stainless steel in it. Um, drop point design, because us being game wardens, we need a drop point, right? We got a mm-hmm. skin, gut, feel, dress. Right. Um, we're, off, we're offering them in serrated, partially serrated, for those of us that cut through really crazy stuff, especially tactical guys mm-hmm. uh, on teams or survivalists. And then we have non-serrated versions as well, because some people prefer a straight edge and not having to deal with, with resharpening the tougher the tougher, uh, you know, little cuts on a serrated blade. So yeah, the whole package is pretty light, pretty small. Um, you get a waterproof, uh, O-ring gasket sealed, uh, box with the knife, uh, that you can put other valuables in and, you know, use it for something other than the knife to keep things watertight, ammunition, identification, whatever in a survival pack. And then, uh, you get a full complement of tools too, with the knife that give you all those extra screws that sometimes come missing from your belt (laughs) clip and you go, dang it. How do I get more screws? And you got to, you know, call a manufacturer and wait a month. Well, we have that included with the tool. All the extra parts are in the box. So this thing is made pretty much to be a one-off for anybody to not only use, but then to maintain. So, and we built them to, uh, to be used and used hard, um, Mm -hmm. on the black handled one on, you can see kind of inside the scales, Wayne, it's got the thin green line runner. Um, definitely, definitely a nice, you know, kind of attractive part of the knife, but that's symbolizing everything we, and anyone else that is concerned about our environmental resources throughout the entire world are behind the thin green line. That is awesome. Um, we also offer them. We also offer them in OD green handled because uh, for the tactical types and the outdoor hunting types that don't want a black handled knife and want to kind of run something, you know, kind of cool and kind of blending with their camo or their or their battle dress uniform, the OD green handles work nice. So, yeah, it's wow. the uh, thin green line trailblazer um, from B knives. And uh, they can be ordered directly through me if they want a personalized pack, or they can go to our website at vknives.com, V-N-I-V-E-S.com, and, and see that and about 60 or 70 other cutting products we have for sale. And for those that are actually watching this on Patreon, you can see John actually displays his knife and talks about it. So if you're on our Patreon site, you can actually see the podcast and see John doing this. And I remember one day we were podcasting, and I keep hearing this click, click click i'm like john there's a clicking noise what what is that clicking noise you gotta stay you know, and he's like oh oh i'm i'm i'm, I'm using I'm, I'm flipping my knife so so that's an automatic flipping release isn't it or is it assisted yeah, it, well, i'm glad you brought that up it's not assisted because we wanted this thing legal all over the country and we didn't need it to be and something mike Villacamp designed and pioneered on a knife design on a uh, a different knife called the uh, jerry Hossum, who's a hall of fame blade maker his deplorable knife that Mike built with him. When I handled that knife, I had never seen a, a camming mechanism like it, Wayne. And I immediately got excited because this little lever right here actually becomes part of the tang. And it's basically a blade guard when you're working the knife hard, but that's the lever. And on a single ball bearing, you get that fast lockup, but wow. it's not a switch blade. It's not spring assisted. And then now look at the lever. It now becomes that area where I'm yeah. going to hold that knife and then with these serrations cut in the top, when I'm really driving the knife, I'm protected from this thing coming back or, you know, my, my index finger getting jammed up on the serrations or that really, really sharp uh, straight blade. So it's an ingenious design that has very little moving parts, kind of like yeah. a Glock pistol, why I like Glock so much. Less is more. Mm-hmm. And that's how this knife's designed. And it is just butter smooth. No, I'm so glad you showed that, that to me. That particular, that mechan- that particular awesome. mechanism is kind of favorable for most people when they see it firsthand, yeah. And it's fast, it's efficient, and it makes that clicking noise. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, one more time just for our viewers because yeah. it just sounds so cool. Why not? There's a click. Um, and it yeah. comes out so fast mm-hmm. you would think it was assisted or something. I always did until you pointed that out. And that, that is that's just very, very well designed, John. I will say that. Just a, just an awesome job for any outdoorsman, any first responder to have that on their, on their hip really quick to, to act, get to a vehicle, to cut somebody out of a seat belt, to break that window. All the things that you need extremely fast is right there. Well, well done. That's just awesome. And the other thing is Thanks, it's great. Brother. Yeah, is, thank you. Is uh, what you bring to the warden's watch? I, I will say this: this interview that we did with Nancy Foley, just oh, top amazing. notch. Yeah. And uh, I know you yeah. worked with her. You always spoke very highly. And after doing this podcast, I can really see why she's just a dynamic woman that has, uh, you know, made a big difference in wildlife 
law enforcement is just, it was dynamic. It's awesome. Yeah, she really did. You know, obviously it's uh, near and dear to me because I did work with her uh, in the field right at the start of my career and then got to see her move up through the ranks, always with the field in mind first and always with a progressive vision for the agency for the benefit of the resource. And without giving too much away of this great podcast we had with her just last week, um, she made a lot, she made a big difference and she allowed guys like me and, and other progressive thinkers in the agency to, uh, to kind of flourish and do some good things, I think for the resource that were pretty unconventional at the time. And, um, we get into that and so much more in the podcast it was one of our just an amazing conversation with Nancy. And I know you guys out there listening and watching are really going to enjoy it because, uh, she's quite a character on all levels. Yeah. And which brings me kind of to our next podcast, because through the conversation that we had after about Nancy, you started talking about uh, some of the undercover work that you guys did in California. And I was yeah. like fascinated with the case that you were talking about. And so we kind of decided that it, we should have a, a, a podcast regarding this case. So that's going to be following this, a California case that you were involved in. And I, I think Nancy was somewhat involved in as well. Is that correct? Or um, she was at the time she was the chief overseeing the agency. Okay. So she, so she, she was, was involved in one way. From that, <laughs> absolutely. She yeah. was in that, that bird's eye view. And, uh, yeah, we worked with her old team, the special operations unit, the covert unit, because, uh, without giving it away, it got so dark and deep down the rabbit hole of really heinous wildlife poaching all over the state of California. Um, that us, us guys on the patrol front really got into more than we can handle. And it just became this great joint case between us and their team that we we initiated in the silicon valley of all places <laughs> and it took us all over the state in national parks and we'll just say that for our viewers yeah. and listeners and nope, uh, i know i I'll was on the edge of my seat when we were talking work. about it and yeah that i'm like that's a podcast so uh you guys will have to check out episode uh 43 for uh the details to that case so here comes nancy Guys, we are super excited today to have retired chief of the law enforcement division of California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Nancy Foley, with us today. Nancy has had 25 years as a game warden. Uh, she started in district patrol, worked in and ran our special operations covert unit, and spent the, the, the latter part of good majority of the latter part of her career as badge number one for all the game wardens in California and my chief. So, Nance. Welcome to Warden's Watch. We are so happy to have you on the show. And how are you holding up out there on the West Coast? Yeah, well, uh, thanks, John. And it's great to see you. Uh, we, um, we're doing okay out here. You know, we're still fighting the battles of COVID. Uh, I'm lucky to live in a, in a really amazing place. I live on the beach in the central part of California, so we don't have as many people as LA or San Francisco. And uh, I can still get out and ride my bike or fish off the bluffs or something like that without a million people right next to me, but uh, it certainly has had its effects. Yeah. And, and some of the stuff you're doing since retirement, and I'm not going to jump too far ahead right now. We're going to get into it, you know, as, as we, as we break down your history and experience, but um, a lot of the international stuff to expand the fingering line message and, and integrate relationships. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that, but uh, sadly that has really been hindered with COVID obviously. And some of the travel you guys do, um, on the international front and, and the stuff Wayne and I are doing even as well. And how have you guys adjusted to that? And, and how are we looking, you know, just for the next year or so on outreach operations on your end? Yeah. So I work with the International Conservation Chiefs Academy. It's sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, INL State Department. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just an amazing program. It's about adapt. We really teach about adaptive leadership and that leaders can come from any place in the division. You know, we have positions of authority, which might be the chief's position, but everybody places their expectations on that one position. And what really needs to happen is leadership comes from all levels. And uh, depending on the situation, anybody can step into that leadership role. And we also are trying to build this network to beat the network of uh, wildlife traffickers. In many of these countries, like in Africa and in Asia, you have countries that are sizes of some of our states and they just cross borders left and right. right. And because of that, it makes it very difficult to track them. So we're trying to build this network where people can communicate across borders and give information, uh, give ideas, uh, talk about people that are 
uh, suspects in Nepal that cross into Bhutan or India. And uh, I was just making a note this morning. So far this morning, I've already talked to somebody in Bhutan, Costa Rica, India, Malaysia, Nigeria, Kenya, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, (laughs) DRC, and the Dominican Republic. So, I mean, that's Uh, what it's going to take, right? mm, It's going to take that network communicating uh, across country lines that will help us do a better job with uh, stopping some of this illegal wildlife trafficking. And the International Conservation Chiefs Academy is what's putting all of that together. It's really cool to see what you guys are doing there, because I know uh, toward the end of my career, especially with a special operations um, lean, and as you were retiring as our chief, wildlife trafficking was becoming the hot button issue everywhere. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, all the states were forming specialized teams. We did it in California. Um, you're seeing it internationally. And um, it's just so good to see you and these groups and organizations and all of us branching out that far <clears throat> and helping and educating at the source and on the end side when, when we receive it here in the U.S. Um, Wayne, you've been doing a lot with the, uh, the Chiefs Academy as well. And this seems to be the wave of the future appropriately so as we continue to progress in wildlife law enforcement. Yeah, no, working with the International Wildlife Crime Stoppers, again, it's been a pleasure. And uh, Nancy and I got a chit-chat a little before John got on. And, uh, it, you know, when you go to certain places and you keep hearing that same name over and, Na- and over, Nancy Foley, Nancy Foley, Nancy Foley, that's, that's when you really know you want Nancy Foley on Warden's Watch because she has <laughs> such an impact. And in my short time speaking with her, I can see I got schooled several times. And uh, I, I could see... <laughs> Why her name is is brought up all the time with people I respect, even though I've never met you, Nancy. So I, I just wanted to say that, and just certainly a privilege. And yeah, I think you know, after being a game warden for so long, we did the best job in the world. We all look, at least I did, John did, I think you did. We looked for that next step because it's it's hard. I felt I tell everybody I felt like I jumped off a cliff when I retired, and I was waiting to land, and I'm like trying to figure out what's my parachute. So, and podcasting mm-hmm. came up and seems to be doing well and telling these great stories of conservation officers around the country and hopefully around the world. Um, it's just been a, a mm-hmm. pleasure to do that and, and to promote them because, you know, we've been all kind of been on TV before with Wild Justice, Northwoods Law. And I will say that certainly has helped this podcast uh, elevate itself so fast with those types of people and with the officers, which I thought was really strange at first because I didn't think we'd have officers listen, but we all sit around and we tell our stories and that's that the public likes to hear our success stories as well as our not so successful stories. I've found out too, because there's been a few times I've been holding the bag and, and didn't catch the poacher. And I think that's important that they know that we're out there trying, even though we couldn't catch them all the time, you know, and tell our success as well as, you know, the, the, the things we learned from as we went on. So just, just uh, your experience, Nancy, 25 years, and uh, y- you've had some dynamic things in California. And, and first, when I talked to John about the MET team, you know, that was an eye-opener in itself. A game warden, tactical team, eradicating marijuana. I'm like, who thinks up this stuff, huh? You know, it's got to be West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm a little jealous at the same time. So, and, and John we always bias it. We like to be progressive. Yeah. <laughs> and you were the beginning of that, Nancy, weren't you? Uh, that 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 team was, well, was under your leadership, correct? Well, uh, some of it certainly was, but you know, I, it's not. It's not me. It's a team. Mm-hmm. You know, for the first time, we were allowed, say allowed to function as a team. <laughs> And uh, great ideas come from many more people than just one at the top. And that's kind of that leadership thing that I was talking about. Yes. Is that it has to come from all levels. And Mm. you can't place all of your expectations on the top person. It has to be this group think. And uh, that's one of the reasons that diversity in our cognitive thinking is as important as our diversity in our ranks. Mm. Right. Absolutely. And the willingness and, uh, and, to you listen. Know, I will say that uh, some of these bigger states also have some amazing tactical teams. Uh, Florida. Mm. So it's Florida. not just West mm-hmm. Coast, but Florida and Texas have some amazing teams as well. And I think that comes when you have a bigger agency. Definitely. You can uh, diversify a lot more when you have a bigger agency, for sure. Yeah, right. Sometimes a smaller agency, I think, struggles to do the day-to-days. Oh. Uh, but certainly it's getting us highlighted within the, with the television shows, what we do and making people aware. Mm-hmm. Cause I just so much after I retired, 
you know, and doing the podcast and, and people watching television and seeing what we do, they always say, I, I never knew you did that. I never knew you did that. Right. You know, right. and, and it's just uh, the education side of this is, is great. And the communications, because like you said, you've been talking to all those people. I, th- I think communications has been, you know, the buzz thing in the last 10 years, probably starting with 9-11 when different agencies didn't even talk to each other about terrorists. And now everybody's okay. trying to communicate because we all have a little piece of that pie to put this together to stop this illegal activity, whether it's terrorism, you know, and that overlaps into wildlife crime as well as the drug trade and everything. And it, just talking because, you know, I know locally when I talk with Border Patrol or talk with my local police to talk with state police, we all have a little piece of that puzzle that puts a case together. And, and right. that's that's pretty awesome because you're, you're right. It is. It's all about working together. And then the availability of people and the wanting to work together because that that's huge Mm -hmm. that's huge so i think a lot of people have been uh pushed down so many times they've got really good ideas like john john's a he's an idea guy you know he comes (laughs) up with hey what about this or what about that or whatever but if you get um if you get silenced too many times then they just become quiet and they just go about their day-to-day job Mm -hmm. and it's that freedom to express ideas and have some of them taken up certainly can't go with everything and i know that john and i had a couple of conversations about things that we couldn't we we just couldn't do at the time Right. right you know everything everything takes time especially when you're making as much change as we made while i was chief uh we couldn't jump too far ahead sometimes or else we'd get pushed way back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, Nance, that's, that's perfectly said because exactly those conversations we had. And I remember in 2004, 2005, when you were, you know, kind of the newer years of you coming in as the chief of our law enforcement division. And it was the most progressive time I ever saw in my career. And I'm sure, you know, for, for everybody in agency, because we were faced with the outreach opportunity of wild justice. And are we going to put our game wardens on TV? And, you know, you and I had those conversations, a bunch of us did uh, with headquarters. And, and that was a big step, you know, to take that chance um, and to get that exposure to exactly what Wayne and his colleagues were seeing with Northwoods Law that came after our show of how much that opened the door, even though there were some risks there. And marijuana eradication and, you know, dedicating some of our officers to the camp program, the Committee Against Marijuana Planning and integrating game wardens with Department of Justice and drug enforcement and sheriffs on dedicated helicopter teams. And some of these other agencies had never seen our capabilities. And there was a real gamble with that. And it was very progressive. Um, And I'm grateful that you did. But it it did keep that progressive trend going and show what game wardens are all about from a comprehensive standpoint. But getting to the outreach, um, when you decided wild justice was something we would do, and a lot of states followed suit positively, including, you know, Wayne and the main guys over there with Northwoods Law, what went into that and, and, and how do you feel looking at the positives and negatives and, and advantages to, to that program for us? Yeah, that was a, I don't know if you can see how much gray hair I have, but <laughs> certainly a lot of that is from that show. Uh, yep. It was a, I thought, uh, it was a huge draw on our officers, for sure. You know, anybody that has a camera in their car 24 seven while you're riding around, right. it's a huge lift for that officer. And initially, we had a lot of um, armchair quarterbacking by other officers. Like right. they'd see an, see an episode and like, oh, my God, they walked around and they had their flashlight in their gun hand. Right. So whoever does that. <laughs> and it was on and on like that until I finally had to send something out that says, just stop. You know, think, yeah. think of yourself riding around every day with a camera on you. And how many times do you make a mistake. Right. And, you know, we have to thank the officers that stepped up and are willing to show the diversity of the job that we do, the breadth of everything that we run into. And uh, I think that quieted it, at least from what I heard uh, where I was sitting. But the positive impact was phenomenal. We, you know, we've been trying to tell our stories really since 1871. <laughs> right, right. And yeah. Uh, tell the importance of the jobs that we do. We, you know, we have our internal uh, outreach programs with the departments. But that first episode of Wild Justice, John, I think it had three or four million viewers yeah. across the United States. And we can't pay for that kind of uh, publicity about the jobs we do, the quality of officers that we have, the things that we come into and in contact with. 
and the jobs that we do protecting the natural resources for the people of the state of California. We just couldn't pay for that. And I thought it was phenomenal. We, you know, we, we certainly had our ups and downs. It complicated some investigations. But to see at our some of our big expos, to see the little kids coming up to some of the officers yeah. and thinking that they were they wanted to be game wardens when they grew up, but little boys and little girls. Uh, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. It, it was amazing the reach we had overnight. Um, and how were, how is a little agency of under 400 officers with minimal, if any recruiting budget ever going to get that type of reach? And I'm really grateful you, you made that call as our chief. And I know I'm, I don't want to speak too much and, and steal Wayne's thunder on that, but all the positives they've seen with Northwoods law in Maine and New Hampshire and all those officers I've gotten to know, especially since retirement um, to this day. Uh, in fact, last night, a Canadian officer emailed me and he was a teenager, a pre-teenager mm-hmm. watching us on wild justice and said, I'm a game warden because of that. Mm-hmm. I, and mm-hmm. you know, we get those emails today still and those contacts and, the ability to mentor young people that all over the world that we would have never reached. So yeah. kudos um, for taking that hit. And you're right. As far as having the cameras with us all the time by season three, that was beyond grueling, but at a certain point we, uh, I think we made a big dent and correct me if I'm wrong, but the recruitment and retention and the applications for jobs after season one and two, just, it went through the freaking roof. And um, I know the, the quality of officers we've been able to hire and the selection process and the diversity of people we started to get, especially veterans and, 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 and women and things like that was, was pretty cool to see. And, and Wayne, you're, you're having kind of that same experience, right, with your exposure with Northwoods Law? Absolutely. And I think Colonel Jordan and Colonel Wilkinson from Maine would have agreed wholeheartedly with you, Nancy, on that. How much PR can you pay for it? Because it's, it's astronomical, the, the impact it's having. But as a lieutenant, I was seeing the draw on the officers. It is a lot of work. It's a ton of work that people don't see. And you get used to being a camera falling around you a lot, but they don't see the little bits. Every time you do something, you have to talk about it. They have to pull you over here after you do it, and, they, and you have to talk. And what? Maybe 5% gets on, you know, for that hour show. Right. And right. <laughs> day after day after day, you're doing this, and you're talking about every little thing you're doing. And it, it, it is tough on those officers. I've seen them burn out and, it, and it's tough and they become very popular and people don't, they keep wanting to see them and they're burnt out. They've had it. So, and it, and it's tough. So it, it is. And I, and I want everybody to know how hard it is for those officers to share their lives and their careers. Cause it, they bring those, those cameras. I've had the film crew eat at my house numerous times. Great, great people. We have been very lucky mm-hmm. with the film crews and Ingle Entertainment. I'll give them a shout out too because they they they've been doing it. They 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 did everything in Maine, which was really nice. And then they came to New Hampshire and we kind of repeated <laughs> things, which all the bugs all were the bugs. worked out. So <laughs> that that was good. <laughs> yeah, it's still a challenge though. No, I mean, no matter how much you get used to them, I think it's a huge challenge and. Uh, I commend John and the other officers that were our primaries. I think the officers uh, learned a lot along the way. Mm. And uh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic for us. There were some significant challenges, like I said, complications with cases and um, and complications with some of the local agencies, but uh, on a whole, I'd do it all over again and had a had you know, if I was sitting in that chair and had that opportunity. Is there a case, Nancy, yeah, it, you could share that had complications? Kind of just give give an idea of what we're talking. Do you have a case that you had in mind that was co- got complicated due to the filming? <laughs> I can think of one in New Hampshire right yeah. off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had um, we had a pretty significant poacher that had um, some unusual characteristics and uh, thought processes and. Uh, we had somebody that some of the wildlife officers interviewed who uh, went off camera, but he was still vocally recorded and talked about the suspect. And um, so when they did the search warrant on the suspect's house, then the, you know, the complication started with threats to the person that gave the information, firebombed his car. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a pretty significant. We, you know, some of the smaller towns have limited staffing, right? Mm-hmm. So we think we have limited staffing yeah. in California uh, for a chief of police to have two officers 
and then have something right. like this come into their <laughs> right. uh, into their city was um, very tough for the the city, and uh, we had to throw a lot of resources at it uh, just to make sure that we we took care of the mess that um, we were in. Mm-hmm. That was just one of the complicating. We had others with uh, people being shot with the camel crew, uh, not our officers, but other people and finding the victims. And yeah, so we had some complications, but again, all in all, uh, it was a very positive thing for wildlife law enforcement to see everything that game wardens come in contact to on a daily basis. Mm. Oh, that's great. And, cer- and, and certainly the, uh, the canine highlights, right, Nancy? Um, I'm seeing... <laughs> <laughs> Wild Justice was so canine heavy, and we're all dog lovers, the three of us here, and most all the game wardens out there. But, and Wayne, we've seen that bleed off in Northwoods Law with the emphasis on great dog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Either detection or maybe in a, we've we generated a lot of canine handler interest <laughs> with that show. But, but Nance, going back, um, let's go back in the way back machine for just a minute. Um, and all the conversations that we had over the years, we never really had this one in any any detail. When did it start for you? What was the, when did the light switch turn on when you said, I need to do this? I need to be a game warden. I need to go out and protect wildlife. This is my passion. Uh, how did it all start? Yeah, so I, I probably didn't have the uh, typical projection of most wildlife officers, but I grew up in Pennsylvania. Uh, I, I've always felt more comfortable outside than inside, unless I was on a basketball court. But uh, <laughs> always outside, that's where I felt most comfortable. I uh, went to Penn State. I got a Bachelor's of Science in Outdoor Recreation. Uh, worked in national parks for a while, Rocky Mountain, Death Valley, Olympic. Uh, was involved in a hiking incident where uh, a friend of mine's father passed away on the hike up Mount Whitney. Mm-hmm. And so we ended up uh, moving back to California from Colorado. And I started working in Anza Borrego Desert State Park as a park interpreter. Mm-hmm. And uh, I gave reptile talks occasionally, and I start. I would run the roads at night looking for reptiles to see what was out on the road to tell the park visitors, you know, what was out there. And one night I was out there, and I'd see, you know, an animal on the road, and I'd hit the brake light, slow down, look out the window, make a U-turn, come back around. And I kept seeing this game warden truck pass me. They'd go <laughs> this way, and then I'd do it again, come, and they'd go that way, and then I'd and then go that way. <laughs> so I finally Herper figured, control. you know what? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to pull in to this campground where I, I lived and uh, waited for them under the light, you know, so they could see what was going on. And it was really my first contact with wildlife officers. Um, my dad was a hunter when I was very, very young, but stopped hunting when he thought it got too dangerous for, I was the youngest of four. And my uncle's, uh, didn't always abide by game laws. And so I think my dad was a little bit afraid of that. And just as a side note, my uncles have passed away, but their children are all great conservationists and are law abiding. And I'm very proud of them. But anyway, uh, these two wildlife officers pulled into where I was stopped and asked me what I was doing. And I told them and we, we stood there and talked for a while. And then they were like, Hey, can we search your car? And I'm like, oh, yeah, go ahead, search my car. And they searched my car. And uh, uh, of course, I didn't have any reptiles in the car. But um, yeah, it was my my first contact. And it, through my work with national parks, I had done some law enforcement in national parks as well. I always felt like, you know, that that was where it was for me is, is to protect the things that I cared most about being outdoors, the environment. And being able to do something about it when I saw people that weren't abiding by the laws. And a flyer came out just after that for being a game warden. And so I applied. And probably about two years later, uh, I, I, I don't know. If, um, so the, the process started then, right? I made the application, put the application in. Uh, I was, went through in, uh, the testing process got called back. They were going to start a background on me, which was difficult for them because I grew up in Pennsylvania. You know, I'm in California right, right. now. And, uh, I had a four-year degree, like I said, a bachelor's of science. And um, the person doing my background, uh, I found out much later some things, but uh, I got a letter that said, you know, we're sorry that you can't continue in the process. You don't have, you don't meet the educational requirement. <laughs> okay. And so in California, it's only a 60 unit requirement. 
you know, some science in it. And uh, so I, that's kind of odd, but, you know, I didn't know a lot about the process. So I, I, I was sad that I wasn't going to be able to do that, but uh, okay. So I, I moved on to whatever was next. And uh, then about a couple of weeks later, I got another letter that said, uh, you know, we, we, we made a mistake <laughs> and uh, you are, you are in the process. So uh, that was great. You know, I went for the next round, made it through everything and uh, went to my first day at work and uh, before the academy where they gave us some of our equipment. And man, there was a lot of anger around me being there. Wow! Like this patrol captain that I met for the very first time, you know, I was stuck up my hand to shake his hand and he was like, nope. Said, you know, you have to carry a gun. I was like, well, yeah. And I, I, I just didn't understand what was happening. You know, I, well, yeah. I had no, mm. no idea. You know, my dad and mom, they, they taught me that I could grow up to be anything I wanted to be. And I, I just wasn't sure what happened. And later after, you know, I was pretty successful in the academy and graduated and started my career down in San Diego. And I can remember vividly stopping at a stoplight one time in this this man pulled up beside me. It was a young man and just started yelling at me that I had his job. I had taken his job. Wow. Like, like <laughs> he doesn't even know who I am. He doesn't know what I've done. You know, he doesn't know the experiences that I've had, the um, studying the different environments across the United States. He, he had, no, but I took his job. <sighs> this is just so strange. What is going on here? Yeah. And it wasn't until years later that I realized somebody told me that I was hired under a quota system. I didn't know that. I thought I got in on, you know, my own standing because I met everything that was there. You know, I graduated sure, first sure. in my academy class. I, wow. I, I, I was, I was, I thought I, I got there just because of what I had done in the past. And um, so I guess the story there goes to, you take a look at the t- about 20 women that were hired during that quota system. Yeah. And uh, so we ended up with a chief, two assistant chiefs, several captains, many lieutenants, and a couple of the people stayed as wildlife officers, first, first level wildlife officers, which I totally respect. And so there's, this is a long story to get to this, but there's got to be some oh, barriers. Great. Please, please. Yeah. In, in our hiring practices that prohibit, people from some people from getting in because all of the women that were hired under that quota system were pretty successful. Those that chose to stay were successful. As soon as the quota system was lifted, we went back to hiring what we had hired before. Yep. So we've got to find those hidden barriers in our practices. And it still goes on today, uh, not as much, but it still goes on today to find out why we, we have these barriers that keep some people out. And I really think that some of it is uh, that we have this idea that people have to, they have to hunt and fish to be right. really good game wardens. And I know this is hard for the Northeast because I know <laughs> some of their hiring practices are all about hunting and fishing, but I can tell you that you can learn that. Mm-hmm. A lot of hunting and fishing is about opportunity. And there are, there are millions of people in this world that don't have the opportunity to go hunting and fishing as they're growing up. But they can learn about it when they're in there. And they might make some of your best wildlife officers. It might take them a little bit longer, but they'll get they'll get there if they have the passion to do that job. So yeah, I guess Nancy. I just got on a soapbox. <laughs> yeah. No, not at all. That's a, that's a great story because it shows where the biases were, you know, when you started that you weren't even aware of. Um, and the quota system and affirmative action hiring that we had when I started going back to you know, 91, 92, it was the same thing. Um, And we hear that a lot. The point you just made that, well, if you hunt and fish, you're going to be more familiar, more comfortable around firearms and people with firearms. Uh, You're, you're going to, you know, grow faster maybe in the career. And maybe for some that could potentially be true, but some of our best game wardens, and I think about all the ones we both trained through academies and seen their careers flourish have come from non-hunting and non-fishing backgrounds. And in a way, maybe there wasn't, a bias there where they went in more objectively and just tried to hit it a little harder because they would, they had that discomfort level, you know, right out of the Academy. Um, and we've seen some great wildlife officers and I agree it, it, it's not a requirement. I think it can help sometimes, but 
definitely not a requirement um, to, to be a good game warden. So didn't didn't realize you had those type of challenges starting out of all the years. So wow. Yeah, no, that's a great story. Yeah, well, there are probably a few more stories that we can tell, but uh, I'll let some of the other people that come on, and hopefully the stories are going away. You know, there's mm. there's a much more accepting uh, group of people it seems like these days because they're they're um, the diversity in uh, gender and thoughts seems to be uh, greater now than it was you know when I started. So. Mm. Yeah, we certainly see it in, in Wayne in California. What we're seeing a lot of is <clears throat> new women officers coming right out of the academy and just crushing it. I'm thinking of on our cannabis enforcement teams, right, Nancy, whether it's the, the marijuana permitting teams, the watershed enforcement teams, wildlife trafficking teams, canine handlers, and and some of our best officers. And it's just really, really neat to see more and more of that diversity and that balance happening. But um, But it's not to the level where it certainly should be yet. And, and I think the whole country is seeing that, especially in these times when we talk about all the issues going on related to equality and opportunity um, and to see it in our own ranks. And it's uh, it's kind of a hot button topic in other areas. And, and I'm mm-hmm. glad you're bringing it up and sharing that. That's, that's uh, mm-hmm. Those are tough stories. Thank you for that. Yeah, Nancy, I always go back and I talk to about Abe in one of my former podcasts who lived in New York City. And the wildlife took him out of New York City. And it wasn't wildlife, the kids that grew up hunting and fishing, they brought him out. It was the robin that was sitting on his backyard. It was the birds that came to his bird feeder. It was the deer yeah. in between the strips of the apartment buildings that drew him out of New York City to become a Pennsylvania officer. And his supervisor, I, I met Abe at a, a game warden gathering, and he told me, Mark was like, Wayne, you got to interview Abe because his story is compelling. And knowing Mark for 20 plus years, I took him at his word and interviewed Abe and it was very compelling. And to this day, that is an example of somebody that, and he te- he tells in his podcast, he had to work his butt off in the academy because he, di- he didn't have that curve that everybody else had. He, he didn't have all that knowledge. So he had to really study and, but he looked at it from a different angle too. So when he had to do his presentation on why he wanted a game warden, he said, you know, I didn't have all the hunting and fishing experience. I had to bring these guys back to New York City to experience what I experienced and the reason that I wanted to have that relationship with the wildlife and just a dynamic mm-hmm. story. And I, he, he touched me and I just, you know, for that to happen, it can happen to anybody and you hit it. It's the passion. It's the passion. When you have the passion, nothing's going to stop you. You know, you're just going to keep going. You're going to keep, you're going to do the best you can. Uh, Talking about Jen Wolf being physically fit, you know that that girl. I I wouldn't I, that woman. I wouldn't mess with her. <laughs> yeah, she's a big, no, very dynamic individual. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, Jen's uh, Jen's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I going back to the hunting and fishing. I I really think that's about opportunity. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so to limit your selections by opportunity. Um, is difficult. You're not going to get that breadth of experience or cognitive diversity that uh, I think we're going to need as we go forward. Absolutely. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And, and Nance, given those, those challenges coming on and those, you know, what you were faced <clears throat> when you started your career with that perception, um, mm-hmm. you didn't hold back. You were progressive from the start. And I remember when you talk about how you got that light switch by meeting that wildlife officer, the Zuna Reptile Patrol, I'm going to go back in the Wayback Machine and mention how we met back in the early 90s. And I was a warden for a year in Riverside County, wet behind the ears, totally inexperienced. And we were thrown into some covert reptile enforcement operations down there in your old stomping grounds, Riverside County, Imperial, San Diego. And at that point, you were on the special operations team and you were working that as well. And out of the blue, we meet (laughs) in the desert late one night. And now we're thrown into a huge learning curve for me, but for you to be in that position as a woman and to take that team where you took it and do the amazing things that were accomplished from the standpoint of commercial illegal wildlife sales. Let's talk about that a little bit. What were the challenges there? What drew you to SOU, which was such a, such a great move and did so much for our agency at the time and beyond. Yeah. Well, thanks for all of that, John. Uh, My first exposure to special operations was during a big abalone undercover investigation. The special operations team at the time had a storefront. They were buying and selling seafood, uh, including abalone. Abalone season was open at the time. 
but they had some target boats that uh, were poaching abalone off the North Coast. And I think it happened because I was the newest officer in San Diego. <laughs> and so, you know, it Fresh was face. A, yeah, a, couple of, a couple of weeks away from home and nobody else could do it. So they chose me and I went north and um, we were on surveillances of commercial abalone divers for weeks at a time. They had a couple of rotating teams and found out some really significant things where through our storefront, you know, the abalone poachers, they'd take 12 dozen abalone, but they would only report 1.2 dozen. So they were significantly under-reporting abalone. And abalone is a shellfish uh, in California that's uh, probably one of the highest dollar value products that we have here other than caviar. And uh, It's delicious. Yeah, it's delicious <laughs> if it's fixed properly. Oh, but I had it fixed but, properly, um, and it was delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it, in, in 19 uh, in the early 1990s we still had a commercial fishery for it it closed down in 1997 in part due to the poaching and then some disease but so these people were significantly under reporting and uh, the team that I was on was following these boats around and we made a, a huge abalone case with one of the commer- two of the commercial divers involved and kind of sucked me in from there and uh, the next time the team had an opening, I went ahead and applied for it and got involved in the, the undercover team. Then I, I went in and out of SOU a, a few times. Um, it's a big draw, just like we were talking about with the TV show, you know, being away from home as much as you are and yeah. uh, on the road over half the month. It was, uh, it was a pretty, pretty big draw. But, um, yeah, that's where I found I, I had a lot of uh, – passion for the undercover work, spin team surveillance, uh, because we made such big cases that impacted mm. the resources so much. And when you followed them around, Nancy, can you kind of explain that and how you guys went about doing that, if you don't mind? Yeah, so we, we, um, we developed into one of the best spin teams in the, in the state, I would say, because we, we had a small number of people when I ran the team. I think we had seven people. Mm-hmm. And so we do surveillance. Uh, some of our abalone poachers would start in Oakland or the San Francisco area mm-hmm. at two, three in the morning. Mm-hmm. They'd go up to the North coast of California. They'd dive and take uh, often over limits, but their personal limit plus somebody else's limit that was there with them. Then they'd drive the whole way back to Oakland, uh, store those abalone and then drive back up to another part of the North coast and dive again in another County and then go back and then hand off their abalone to a middle person that would then go and sell the abalone. So our job as a surveillance team was to follow the suspects and the product from uh, the time that they left the house until the time they sold the product. Mm. We made some pretty um, huge cases where people were making several hundred thousand dollars a year wow. uh, uh, abalone coaching. Wow. So huge. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great team effort. It's a, yeah. it's a lot of watching doors and following cars. But a lot it, of spotting it, it scopes, a lot be... of binoculars. Uh, a lot of really close work, too. Spotting really? scopes yeah. and binoculars, for sure, when they're on yeah. the North Coast. Yeah. But a lot of um, up close, you know, following people through San Francisco traffic. Wow. And through the city of San Francisco as they're going to sell their abalone at casinos or nail salons or... Uh, mm. massage parlors or markets you know wow. it's all it was all very interesting all very um intense work when you were following the suspects and a uh, lot of hours of just sitting and waiting mm. for the door to open or the car to move or something like that but we had a great team uh, everybody had their forte whether it was you know speeding up to follow the person or taking the notes down as to what we did <laughs> everybody had a forte so mm-hmm. yeah, it was a it was a great time. We made some significant cases, and that's one thing about diversity. We didn't have any other way to break into these groups because they they didn't look like us and they didn't talk like us. Right. So the only way that we could make these cases was to follow them and make the observations. Mm. Nope, that that's really interesting. Certainly, uh, the only exposure I've had to abalone is eating it, and that was in Oregon. And uh, yeah, uh-huh. no, uh, I'll never forget it. It was great, and I know it's pretty rare, and it's a commodity for sure. And I didn't realize, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars—that's a uh, pretty, pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty good poaching livelihood, so to speak. Kind of like the elvers that we we deal with on the East Coast. And yeah, no, that's that's neat. And 
yeah, undercover work is, is, a, is a lot of fun, like you said. But, and then the, the being not seen in some of those areas, I mean, you, you might have stood out <laughs> in some of those areas you were oh, following, right. too. Right. So it's, uh, Especially in close that, you know, you're, you're hiding on the bluffs on the north coast and you're in camo. Mm-hmm. And you walk downtown San Francisco and Chinatown in camo, and that just doesn't work. Yeah, that would you yeah. stand right out there. <laughs> <laughs> Complete, as we say in circles of training, that is a target indicator. Short yeah. thumb, stand out. Mm. But you know, Nancy, the interesting part about and and I did, I was very lucky to do a lot of work with you guys, both on the patrol front and you know doing warrant takedowns when it was time to make the big bus, but also integrating in with your team and doing those long surveillances and. Um, Something we teach in the academy, I mean, obviously my forte always was rural and field craft, more wooded operations, get way back in the backcountry, tactically, whatever the case may be. But it was the stuff I really learned back in the day with you guys on urban surveillance and getting in close to people and being able to shift on the fly. Where, like you said, you're in camos one minute, you know, on, on bluffs and spotting scope at hundreds of yards. And now you're on foot in downtown Chinatown walking, trying to make observations and trying to blend as much as you can in a very culturally diverse city. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and doing that maybe for 24, 48 hours at a time with little if no breaks. Um, that's, that's a real drain on a game warden, in, no matter how motivated you are. And something we push now with cadets at every level in California, and I know other states, that you, you have to be able to shift on the fly and, mm-hmm. and improvise and overcome and adapt so quickly. And one of the real neat things about us as game wardens is integrating that skill set as fun as it is, but as arduous it is to make a good case. And, and so you brought that and it really was a template for all of our officers in California with the surveillance schools, you guys would put us at the patrol level through Mm -hmm. at the start of our career and and working with other states. So um, those are some great career memories for me. And I know, you know, the, the, the young game wardens coming up in the Academy just love those classes. Uh, It's one of their favorites and they get so much out of it. And then we hope to keep them from being that quote unquote windshield warden, right? Where they just want to stay in the truck. They just want to wear a, you know, standard patrol uniform and they want to stay near the safety blanket and not go too far and, and get those mistake cases, not really get those intentional resource violators. And uh, it, it's cool to see what, what you guys were doing there and what we're, what we're having to do all over the country now, especially with wildlife trafficking being so huge. Yeah, it, it'll shift again. I mean, in storefronts might, might be the next opportunity or, uh, I, I'm not sure integration. We certainly did the the hunting illegal hunting guides. We helped other states out since California sends a lot of um, illegal hunters to other states. <laughs> we we posed as those as well. And uh, I can remember doing a lot of bear ops in Colorado in Operation Beetlejuice. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean we we did all of that what we would consider traditional undercover work as well. But uh, our focus really with the priority species in California, abalone, sturgeon, um, bear, bear gall. That's, that's where we, we found our success rate. Do you have a favorite? Yeah, it is, it is a lot of time sitting in a car and um, <laughs> as new, as young officers, uh, that's not where you need to be is sitting in a car. Nope. You have to be out there yeah. among them. Yeah. For sure. Do you have a, a, when you were undercover, do you have a favorite case that you did? Was that the abalone case or do you have a, I, I, Warden's Watch, the, the, the listeners just love Game Warden stories. So I always try to, to pull those out as much as I can, Nancy. And Undercover, I yeah. think you're the first Warden we've had on that really has talked about Undercover. And that's a uh, that's pretty, pretty cool thing. I think a lot of people don't think of us because they see us on TV all the time in uniform and dealing with the traditional things, that we have uh, some untraditional duties as well, which... Uh, come into such a, a, a broader scheme and a bigger case usually that has a greater impact on protecting the resource other than fishing without a license. And that's just great to bring people in to listen about those cases. Um, anything that sticks out in your mind? I know I, I hate to put you on the spot like there this because there's so, so many. many. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for Hard. a long time. Uh. <laughs> uh. Hard to even get down to even a top five on this. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, we, we did some amazing things. Like most game wardens, we have some amazing stories. Um, it just always – really when things fall together ahead, correctly – that's what always amazes me because everything should go wrong and it comes together correctly. You know, like I, I remember pulling a camera off an illegal bait and I actually had the guy as he's pouring out the donuts look at the camera that was probably 
three or four feet away from him and get a shot, you know, and then, you know, slide that across to him as you're doing the interview. Cause it's not me, not me, not me. You slide that. And he's like, where'd you get that? Cause that's the most, I, I would have yeah. never, <laughs> never thought that would have happened. Just that, that was yeah. the best picture in the world that got you moment. And it was totally, yeah. it was totally, it wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me. And then you slide that picture. How'd you get that? You know, I was just, it was the gotcha moment. And that, those are the greatest things when you have, especially surveillance. In that case, it was like four weeks of, you know, hiking a couple miles back into the back country in the night mm-hmm. to set up surveillance and all the extra work you put on. And it's, it was just a, it was a crazy time what we were doing and then trying to get our other duties involved in doing that undercover. Yeah. And, you know, the remoteness of it really uh, was really taxing too, especially hiking at night slows you down by two or three different times. And you don't want to leave the, mm-hmm. the sign there. So you're, you're trying to go different routes every time. And yeah, John, I, John's shared a few of those with me, <laughs> but those are the, that's the kind of the, the gotcha moment is, um, you know, if, if you ever had one of those cases that had you the gotcha, which I, I know you have, and it's just, uh, oh, yeah. those are fun. Yeah. So for, for surveillance teams, we, you know, we, a lot of the district attorneys, especially in the big cities that weren't familiar with wildlife cases needed to mm. see money exchange. Okay. So that money exchange was our gotcha picture. Ah. And just to think about trying to position yourself in a city with traffic or parking lots to get that moment of the money exchange was um, a real success for us. We, yeah. we worked long and hard to try and get that. We spent many hours in the back of vans uh, telling a lot of stories uh, to get that money exchange picture. But yeah, the, the money exchange and, you know, the funny things that happen in surveillance or undercover work are just, <laughs> we could write novels about it, but right. <laughs> I, I'll never forget this one time I worked with an officer who uh, worked in Montana. He was one of my favorite officers in California when he was a California officer and really yeah. my mentor as a game warden, Joe Kennard. Uh And Joe left California and went to Montana and uh, has since passed away. But uh, <laughs> when we were in California and we worked in the undercover unit together, we often posed as husband and wife. And Joe was not married. And um, <laughs> it was, uh, I can already hear there. This one's going. This is great. <laughs> we were working a case in another state and as husband and wife. And, um, and it was so funny to hear Joe try and say that we were married. He was like, I I'm we're mim, 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 and I like had to whack him in the back to get the married part out. <laughs> and then Joe and I had worked hundreds of cases together, so uh, I knew I could do this and do it safely. I threw in a couple of kids with him unsuspecting. <laughs> we were talking quite a family. To the, nice. <laughs> talking to the suspects and we ended up uh. staying with the suspects and um, for uh, too long. Uh, But we ended up staying, we had to sleep in this teardrop trailer and the suspects were really um, leery because they were doing a lot of lion lion, uh, poaching and bear gall poaching. Mm. And so we we had to be very, very careful with everything that we had. And so we, we were both sleeping in sleeping bags on the same side of this trailer because that's what they would expect. Right. And uh, they, they jumped in at like two in the morning. They just came busting through the door just to see what was going on in there. Mm -hmm. And I think Joe actually like jumped out of his sleeping bag, whacked his head so hard. (laughs) He he almost had a concussion. Um, And then, I mean, the place was filthy. You know, people think that it's really cool to be out going with some of these guides. And I'll tell you, they're not the pillars of society, most of them. Mm. And the house was filthy. The food, the plates were filthy that we ate the food off of. Mm. And after several days, the suspect smoked. And because I was the the girlfriend or the wife, the wife, I had to sit in the middle, you know, so I was getting all that Uh, cigarette smoke. And I just, I had to take a shower. So I go in the house and uh, go to take a shower and I'm standing there. (laughs) There's like this much room underneath the bathroom door and all of his kids are lined up looking under that bathroom door. <laughs> so I, I'm just like, okay, well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> He's getting crazy. <laughs> so, wow. That was a good one. And 
you know, we, we worked many hunters in the same area. And so we had to change our appearance somewhat going from hunting location to hunting location. So I'm not usually one to like dye my hair or anything, but I ended up as a platinum blonde at one point uh. and uh, <laughs> glasses and dangle earrings. And yeah, was, those were the days. That was yeah. a lot of fun. We got a lot of people that uh, needed to be caught. Nice. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was happy for the opportunities. Yeah, I just can picture Joe too. Uh, you, you put him in those positions, and I, <laughs> and he's got Joe no a, recourse. You throw the couple of kids no, in, no, he, he's no. got, he's there. He's yeah. not the, he's got no recourse. <laughs> you can see the sweat breaking. Yeah, out. He's thinking about having children. Yeah, he's like, you wait, Nancy. I'll get you back someday. <laughs> <laughs> he, he ended up having uh, uh, two children. His daughter is mm. uh, very successful. And so hopefully I broke that door down for him, for him you know, to yeah. say that he actually had children or think about having children. <laughs> oh, that's there great. you go. Yeah, it's, it's just, just, just an added officer safety part of the part of the operation because it lended credibility. Joe knows it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's no, I mean, t- t- tons of great cases, but um, um, fast forwarding just a little bit. And thinking of your tenure as our chief, uh-huh. what do you, what would you say is the biggest accomplishment that you were satisfied the most with during that tenure before retirement? What were the biggest challenge or challenges you faced given the diversity of the agency, your background, and everything we face as officers on the West Coast? So I didn't, I, I didn't know that they had selected me. Ryan Broderick was our director at the time. And he grew up through the wildlife officer ranks. He was never our chief, but he was a deputy director for the department. He was, and then became the director for our department. And, um, you know, we, there were a number of people that applied for the position and Mike carry on who became the chief right after I did. Mm-hmm. And I had come together and I loved Mike and I would have worked for him in a heartbeat. And he felt the same about me. And we, we both had this vision to the future of what, conservation law enforcement should look like in California. And we, we both knew that one of us had to get that job or else we would be um, possibly stuck in the same things that we'd been doing in the past that didn't really bring us into the future. So I was fortunate enough to um, push Ryan in a direction that he gave me the opportunity to go in. And the day that they made the selection uh, we were all sitting around a table, all the, the assistant chiefs, the uh, current chief at the time, and one of the deputy directors came in and uh, made the announcement that I became chief. And I literally saw a wall of responsibility coming <laughs> right. at me. I mean, I really did. Uh, I could. I, it was yeah. like a visual wall of responsibility mm. that was coming right at me, and there was no way that I could duck it. And so I took that feeling from that day, and I'm. I carried it, hopefully, for the whole term of my tenure. And that was that responsibility, not to see the wildlife officers or the division as it was, but to see how it could be um, in the future. Because I think that the job of the chief is really to be doing the day-to-day things, certainly, but having that vision to the future as to what's next. Where do we have to be to make ourselves relevant to the people of the state, whatever state you're in, next? How do I best protect the officers? How do I put them in the best position to be successful in the future? So challenges, well, we were, um, we hadn't really changed in a very long time for a number of reasons, (laughs) whether it was budget or leadership or, or whatever, but we hadn't changed. And we'd actually gone a little bit away from our law enforcement roots. You know, all of our officers go through the law enforcement academy. We're peace officers with the state of California first. We've got the expertise in wildlife as our secondary. And uh, I felt a great deal of responsibility for our public re- public safety responsibilities to the people of the state. And I knew that not many other law enforcement agencies knew that we had we also had that responsibility. And I felt that it was time that we took on those responsibilities and uh, became a uh, brothers and sisters with our law enforcement community in other capacities. So we moved forward. Uh, You know, people didn't have to write as many incident reports when they were doing traditional law enforcement, making contacts. Uh, Some some wildlife officers liked it. Some some did not. Uh, 
uh, it was like a change. And I, as we talked about earlier, one of my favorite sayings was change is inevitable. Growth is optional. Uh, some people chose not to change. Other people uh, really accepted the challenge and grew along with the changes that we were making in the division. And again, it wasn't just me. It was a whole team of people that really made it happen. Yeah, Nance, it was, it was neat to see that during your tenure because we had never had such an emphasis before you came on board as our chief of officer safety related public safety missions and being prepared mm -hmm. for it, whether it was more advanced tactical training to integrate with other law enforcement officers and be a force multiplier smoothly, equipment especially. And um, those of us that were part of your training staff at the defensive tactics and the firearms level, myself being one of those lucky guys, I'm really grateful to that because we got to expose the agency and expose new and veteran officers to really, you know, step it up a notch or two or three. And the credibility and diversity we saw and the, I think the respect and legitimacy I started to see all over California with other allied agency law enforcement teams, it was, it was exponentially bigger and better and necessary. Um, but that was a big step. I know not everybody liked it and, you know, some go kicking and screaming, but that's the, the change versus growth, as you, as you like to say, and I like to quote as well. Um, when you retired and you, and you got to that point, I remember that day, that was, that was a bittersweet day, it was a celebration, but it was, it was tough to see you go, of course. We're super happy for the next phase for you. Um, what did you look back on fondly? And was there, was there any box that you didn't get checked? Was there anything unchecked that, you know, just, just couldn't happen in, in the time frame or, or given where we were mm -hmm. as an agency when you left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my last day was was really a, an amazing day. I uh, my my father had passed away suddenly. My mother had some dementia. I needed you know friends and family first, right? So I had the, I had enough time. Uh, I was pretty much maxed out with my time, and I needed to take care of family so I could hang on until we graduated a, our the last class that I was there for. Yep. So I was standing there swearing in the new cadets. And as soon as that um, ceremony was finished, I walked out the door and it, it couldn't have been better. Really, it couldn't have been better. And the next day I was taking care of my mom, you know, making her breakfast in Florida. So that was wow. all fantastic. It worked out uh, really well. And to see, you know, it's all about that. It's I knew that as soon as I left that chair, somebody else was going to come and sit in it. They're going to, they may take it in a different direction. And that had to be okay with me because um, I wasn't in that chair anymore. But I thought I did what I could do while I was there. Things that I didn't check, John, uh, our numbers weren't as high as I would have liked them to be. I would have liked yeah. to have had 600 officers by the time I left. I... Um, would have liked to have had a more diverse workforce. And I still regret that I had, it, that takes time, but I should have focused more on it. Um, I, uh, there's just so many things, you know, <laughs> you have a big list in front of your desk. You still have you, vision. Yeah. You check one off and you yeah. put three on. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to have that list in front of your desk so that you keep focus on, on the future, not necessarily the day to day things. Um, yeah, for big things, I, uh, you know, I think we positioned ourselves well with marijuana and I think that, uh, I think we need, sure did. needed to do more with, uh, having relevance with law enforcement off the pavement. I mean, cause that's really where our expertise is. And we have plenty of officers that are in big cities and urban areas and they do fantastic jobs there, but uh, there are a lot of other law enforcement that can do traditional law enforcement in that capacity. There aren't a lot of other law enforcement that have the expertise that wildlife officers do off the pavement. And I, I wish I, I could have um, promoted that more, uh, tr more traditional law enforcement and to the public, really the public's where I needed to be. Yeah, yeah you definitely got the ball, ball started there though. And, and definitely um, you mentioned Mike Carrion, he came in behind you and the vision you both shared he perpetuated what had been started and I'm grateful to you both for seeing that as, you know, like you said, an idea guy, but more seeing us progressive and just growing for the sake of the resource. Um, since your retirement, I mean, everything from the standpoint of Matt and wildlife trafficking and all these other teams that have developed, we are becoming the people that they call now for those backcountry, high risk, um, active shooter responses, 
um, you know, lost hikers, our canines are doing amazing work, our, our tactical units, our patrol guys and, and women are doing great work now. And that started there with you and kudos and thank you. It's, it, it takes a long time because that's such a big change for us when you, when you and I started. Um, and going into retirement now, it's been a handful of years, but you didn't stop. You didn't stop being progressive with everything we talked about at the beginning of the podcast with the ICCA and, and, the, and the different groups you're working with. And you're a board of direct, you're one of the uh, board members of the California Wildlife Officers Foundation. And as you know, that's near and dear to me in retirement. I promote it as much as I possibly can with the good work you guys are doing. But for those listeners and viewers that don't know, could you just give us an overview of what you're doing with that, with that great foundation and what it's all about? Yeah, it is something that I'm really proud about, John. Uh, so that in 2007, actually in 2006, one of uh, the wildlife officers, Jerry Carnell, uh, also featured on Wild Justice, met with yep. one of the <laughs> landowners. And the landowner uh, couldn't, didn't really understand why, when he called 911, that there wasn't a game warden that could come and help with hunter trespass on his property or poaching on his property. Just so happens that this person is a tremendous philanthropist and a great yeah. thinker. And uh, through contact both with Ryan Broderick and myself and Jerry Carnell, uh, this person uh, developed a foundation and he brought in some other amazing, generous, humble people as, our, as the founding fathers of the California Wildlife Officers Foundation. And since that time, there's a, uh, we've built a, a, a corpus of several million dollars and we treat it as an endowment. And we only use a very small percentage, just a couple of percents of, of a year. And we've given out close to $1.2 million to wildlife officers and their families since 2007. Incredible. And just uh, last week, we gave out $80,000 in scholarship awards to wildlife officers, and their spouses, and their children for this upcoming year. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's. We protect those who protect our natural resources. We try and step in when it's not covered by government. Uh, we try to do the right thing for wildlife officers. Um, we support the canine program. You know, if they have emergency vet bills, something like that, that, that can't be covered by uh, traditional payment methods in an expeditious manner, we try and step in. We step in for team building, like the Baker to Vegas relay run for the wildlife uh -huh, officers. Uh -huh. In the yep. past, every <laughs> officer used to have to pay for that themselves. And now we right. we sponsor the team as it moves forward. And in catastrophic situations where we, you know, we just had a young officer that lost his life to a mm -hmm. cancer. And uh, through John's help and V-Knives help, uh, we had a donor that purchased 100 V-Knives. And we sold 100 V knives in three or four days mm -hmm. at $100. And we gave a $10,000 check to the widow of that wildlife officer within two weeks of when her husband passed. We, uh, you know, when they had that big fire up in uh, Paradise, California, and thousands of people lost their homes, we had a wildlife officer that lost his home, his wife. Parents lost their home. Uncles and aunts lost their home. We put a GoFundMe site up for that wildlife officer. And within a week, they had raised like 60 some thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we just cut it off because there were other people that needed money. But we were right. able to funnel that money to the wildlife officers. So uh, we're really there to protect those who protect our natural resources. And it's uh, probably something that I've always felt. Uh, even as chief, trying to protect those who protect our natural resources. And the foundation is amazing. I work with amazing people on it, really giving, kind, caring. And I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, Nancy, kudos to that. It, you've done some great things. The whole foundation has. And everything you just mentioned that you just, that not every agency is fortunate to have, they make or break some programs. I remember when we were starting to, you know, stand the MET team up. And to have money for equipment and specialized canine harnesses that we had no budget for before any of this cannabis money was rolling in, we were starting from scratch. And you guys on the foundation literally made that unit give us the ability to do our job safely by providing that necessary, you know, tactical gear that we had just never used or seen before and getting our dogs really dialed in for the unique, you know, circumstances they work in on, um, 
on trespass grow work. And so thanks for what you're doing out there. The more we can promote what uh, CalWAP is doing, the more I certainly will. And Wayne, I know you don't see these in, in all the, uh, the states back east, but if these foundations can be formed up, I mean, I'd certainly, we'd all like to certainly see mm. every conservation agency in every state have one, mm-hmm. especially some of the, especially agencies that are even more limited on budget than California is. And the more uh, I talk to other agencies all over the country, the more I realize, wow, I thought we had it rough in my early days in California. Heaven, man, there is some major deficits for these smaller states mm-hmm. and the challenges they're facing um, that foundations can help with. So thanks, Nance, for that. And uh, we'll certainly keep promoting and supporting everything we can with CalWAP and, and everything else you're doing there. Yeah, it's a, it's a great foundation. And again, we'll, we'll help any state you know, we'll give you our bylines and uh, it, we'll help in any way we can. But we think it's a really important thing to to help protect the wildlife officers in the state. And every state has people that would probably step up and do it. There's one thing, Nancy, I'd like uh, standing up of the Met team, because that's pretty unique to California. And I know John's really, and he's been on my, we've done podcasts about it and stuff. But from administrator, from the beginning, I just, uh, you know, I, I put myself in those <laughs> shoes and I had to put myself in the shoes when I was even doing a podcast with John as a game warden and finding out, switching my whole thinking that this was a marijuana issue instead of it's a natural resource issue. So I changed my mind. But if I walked into the colonel's office and said, hey, you know, I think we should start a marijuana eradication team. Yeah. It, you know, you know, it's that it's that breaking of traditional uses and then resources mm-hmm. and all that. But um, if that was in your tenure, I would would like you to speak to that because uh yeah again i always put my my feet in their shoes and i'm like i don't think i could ever make that happen even if it well and the problem you have is very unique to california i believe so or maybe not so if you could speak on that yeah i think that's one of those things that you're looking to the future you know what's the next best best next big thing in california mm-hmm. and how do we uh, we look at that. How do we evaluate that for our officers? Is that something that we need to do? And how do we evaluate that for the natural resources? Mm. And in California, I really felt that illegal marijuana cultivation was the number one destroyer of habitat outside of permitted construction. Mm. And uh, that's our job, right? Natural resources. Yes. So it was easy for me to see the connection between working in marijuana and natural resource protection and john and his teams and even when he didn't have a team <laughs> and when john was working marijuana uh, was like the, yeah. it, it was a it was a group effort with some of the sheriff's departments um you know they they brought me enough information and pictures that could help me tell the story when i went in front of the legislature mm. or when i went in front of the director or the constituents and to tell them the importance of what we needed to do. Uh, traditional law enforcement was a big component in that, but they were, again, we're, that's, that's our playground, off the pavement. That's where we're the experts. Yep. And Amen. so we, we needed to take a leading role in that. And the destruction of the habitat, the impact to the species was so significant that I would have been remiss to not want to take a leadership role in that. And that's, that's how I, that's how I felt with marijuana. And I think that, you know, now they're looking at what's next after we'll, we'll stay in marijuana, but what's, what's the next big thing in California, ocean protection. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, what is it? How do we, how do we, how do you insert yourself into the, to maintain your relevance? Because I think, you know, relevance is an important thing and wildlife officers traditionally run silent and deep. We don't tell people what we do. Um, right. And without telling people what you do, they don't know how to support you when it comes to things like budgets or laws um, or day-to-day things that you need. So that's another thing that Cal Wolf does. That's the thing that the department does. But that's why we got involved in the team. That was kind of my decision-making process. Initially, the first time we went out on some of these teams, they were just cutting down plants. Mm-hmm. They weren't uh, doing any resource protection. It was all about plant numbers. And then we had a meeting with the Department of Justice that didn't go very well about (laughs) uh, resource protection (laughs) and cleanups. And eventually, uh, maybe two or three years into it, John, 
That's yeah. when they started yeah. finding, realizing that most Californians didn't care about the plant count, but they cared about the environment and taking care of it. Mm. So that's where the shift happened. Nice. Yeah, Nansen, one of the one of the biggest rewards for me and what you started, and again, grateful for this, is when we finally got past those traditional-minded agencies that wanted to do the plant count and leave that super fun site behind, not catch any suspects, not put any prosecutions forth for any deterrence. And it took honestly five to seven years. But by the time our official MET team was formed up and about two years into that, and now with the team doing it behind my retirement and, and yours and Mike's, it is so cool to see the other agencies that are saying, hey, we're going to supply a helicopter. We're going to bring in bodies to reclimate. We will get our investigators to do water sampling as well because you guys are now statewide and you're one of the only teams. Um, seeing agencies actually get on to the conservation and environmental protection kick coming from a non-conservation background, that's one of the most rewarding things I ever saw in the career and I mm -hmm. still see it. And uh, that started right there in your tenure. So um, when we talk about relevance, I don't think we can be more relevant, one, when we go into a direction like this, right? But also when we get the other non-traditional agencies that aren't off pavement, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, because we're telling the story and they're seeing it. Um, and it's just been really, really good to see. So, so kudos and thanks again on that. Mm. Uh, and the other thing on that is, you know, it, it does break us from tradition. And what we have to remember is the mission of the Department of Fish and Wildlife in California is really broad based. It doesn't say that the mission is just for hunters and anglers. Right. Certainly they are uh, where we started and they will always be with us. But it's really broad based and it's about all Californians and their enjoyment of our natural resources. And the relevance part we were talking about is we have to be relevant to a broader base of people in our states to show them what we do. So wild justice, things Northwoods Law, the Texas Game Warden Show, that's showing everybody uh, that it's not all about hunting and fishing, but mm -hmm. it's about protection of our natural resources, clean water, habitat that benefit all of the people of the state. I think that's a, that's a really important message and it speaks to our relevance and where we're gonna be in a hundred years from now. Yep, for sure. Nope. Can you on. think of, as we uh, Wayne, you have any uh, any other thoughts before? I just think it's great that you're still carrying it on, Nancy, and uh, it's the next step, and that you still have that passion, and you're carrying it on beyond California, you know, beyond the United States. Uh, I think you're valued among wildlife law enforcement professionals, and uh, I, I just. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's a passion. It's in your system. And I really appreciate what, what you're doing beyond California now. That, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Thanks. I'm, I'm just so happy that I have the opportunity that uh, keeps me connected. Um, and I really think it is the way that we protect wildlife across the world mm -hmm. is to be able to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful for the U S fish and wildlife service for the opportunity uh, for Randy, Randy Stark, that's been on your show before. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just an amazing uh, instructor, has a big picture vision mm -hmm. for leadership. And, uh, you know, for people like John that are out there pushing the message about, cons and you, about conservation and wildlife officers and the stories that we have and the roles that we play. Mm. Oh. Nope, that's great. Oh, I think we've covered a ton of it. So, um so any, anything in closing, Nancy, anything else? I mean, it's just your show as much as our show. That's what I like to say to the wardens. This is, <laughs> this is more about you than it is um, about us. <laughs> or just uh, as you, any you message know, you want to get out there. It's a, you know, how proud I am of the men and women that do this job. Mm. Um, it's, it, it's going to be such a challenge in the future with a uh, changing environment and population numbers expanding and for them to to put on their uniform every day and go out there and i know it's a great job sometimes but other times it's you know it's it's a grind mm -hmm. and i just wanted to say thank you to all of them and to all of the people that the other podcast listeners that uh support these men and women as they go about and do their jobs mm. so i'm pretty proud of them <laughs> very well said yeah. Thanks, Nat, so much for uh, for coming on today and and diving into some stuff uh, 
going way back from the beginning and, and, and where we're going in the future. And certainly if there's anything we can do to help your efforts, mm. you know, you have us on speed dial and thanks for everything you're doing and uh, anything you need, you got. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. It certainly was a fun walk down memory lane <laughs> and uh, I'll probably have a smile on my face the rest of the day and the same for you and any of your listeners. If there's anything we can do to help or I can do to help, just let me know. Please join me, Game Warden Wayne Saunders, and other Game Wardens on our adventures, protecting wildlife, saving lives, and having fun, all while serving the public and the natural resources of our planet. Listen to the tales and experiences of those who work in the outdoors while being entertained with stories about encounters with poachers, wildlife investigation, murder investigation, near-death experiences, search and rescue missions, wildlife interactions from Game Wardens around the country and around the world. When I retired, I realized I couldn't let go of that legacy, but rather wanted to share the passion, the commitment, and the stories of those men and women that call themselves Game Wardens. This is Game Warden, Wayne Saunders, and this is Warden's Watch.